All right, I'm really excited for this message today because we are going to talk about something that, you know, I'm, I'm going out on a limb here, and we're going to talk about something that probably only affects a very small percentage of you, okay? Are you guys okay with that? And the topic is... If there was ever good timing on something, that was it. All right. All right. I'm going to rein it back in here. I'll I'll just go straight to my title. The title for today is The Path to Overcoming Anxiety. Ooh. There There was a handful of oohs, and then it got, like, real quiet there for a second. Right, So, of course, I'm just kidding to where this only applies to a few of us because this applies to, well, every single one of us, doesn't it? A um, couple of true stories here. How do you refer to someone who got over their anxiety? Past tense. There it is again. So, oh, boo, boo, not ooh. Okay, what? Um, did you know this is true? Research shows that facial tattoos completely eliminate certain forms of anxiety. Like, you'll never worry about finding a job. <laughs> All right, last one. one more. You, got, you guys got one more in you? All right. Being a pastor with such an amazing sense of humor, it's really bad for my anxiety. Because whenever I'm on stage, people are just laughing at me. All right, all joking aside, anxiety and worry, it can be crippling. Seriously. It it, it can just wreck you. It's a joy stealer. Anxiety, worry, when it just festers in our lives, it steals our joy. It's a peace taker. It is a normal eliminator. Like, normal is gone. There's no more normal. And it is a confidence destroyer. Anxiety and worry will absolutely just demolish your confidence. It will wreck your life. Now, we're going we're gonna to talk about this in the biblical way. But I, I want to say right off the bat, please understand that I, I fully understand and I know just from watching it firsthand and seeing it uh, just around me a lot that anxiety, uh, mental disorders are very, very, very serious. So I do not take this lightly. I, I really, really need you to know that. And there, there are medical conditions that must be treated with proper therapy, with proper prescription medications. I mean, I am all for that. So please understand, as we talk about this today and we joke a little bit here and there, and, and, and I just give you a really simple answer on how to deal with it today, please understand, I know how severe it is. And I know there are actual medical conditions that are absolutely wrecking lives. And Jesus wants to heal those. Jesus has the prescription that we're going to look at today. Um, There was this couple that had been married for about 10 years. And she was absolutely ridden with anxiety and worry that someone was going to break into their house in the middle of the night. And, And pretty much every single night, she thought about it and she worried about it. And to, to where it, she, she couldn't sleep at night and every little creak in the house, every little sound, she would jump up thinking a burglar had broken into their house. Like, like you, you've had that before, right? Like when you hear like the dishes settling, anyone had the dishes settle in the middle of the night? Like it will freak you out. Now why in the world someone would break into your house and mess with the dishes in your sink? I haven't figured that part out yet. Okay, but like, like every little noise, she would freak out. Well, one day, 10 years, or one night, 10 years into their marriage, they were sleeping, and they heard something in the downstairs. 
And she was like, honey, honey, I heard something. Will you go check it out? And he's like, well, I kind of heard it too. Let me go downstairs. So he goes downstairs and he looks and he flips the light on. And sure enough, there is a burglar standing there in his downstairs. And instead of panicking, he says, listen, can can I ask you something? Can I ask you to come upstairs and meet my wife? Because she's been waiting for you for 10 years. Here's the point. A burglar can steal from you once, but the burglar of anxiety can steal from you for decades, every single day. Now, now, I'm not knocking people who have fears. Like, like I, I have some fears that I deal with. Just being transparent, I don't like spiders, Okay? Now, snakes, I'll take snakes all day long. Spiders are not my thing. They freak me out. I had a thing this week, okay? Just, just being honest. But, so I'm not knocking all of us because we all have some legitimate and illegitimate kind of fears. We also have a lot of cautions in our life, right? Like we've got we've to stay healthy and we've got to do things right. And we've got to like, so we do things like filter our water, right? I mean... Does, does anybody drink from the tap anymore? I mean, like, we've got a filter. I know there's a handful of you. And it's, it's made, you know, some studies show it's good for you. That's okay, right? But it's like bottled water and filter this and filter that, okay? Um, we use antibacterial soap on pretty much everything right now, right? And we, like, hand sanitizer. I mean, like, we take a bath in hand sanitizer sometimes. Um, re- remember during covid that we were told to, we should wipe down our groceries with Clorox wipes when we brought them in the house. Or you let them sit out on the porch and bake in the sun a little bit so all of the bad stuff will bake. We were told that, okay? Um, Some of us eat only or mostly organic food because we want to be healthy. There's a lot of impurities and there's a lot of bad stuff out there. Science has proven that, okay? Um, Even our household supplies, we try to have organic. Like, I'm not sure that you need an organic blanket or like an organic can opener, but I mean, they have them, right? For people that are, and again, I'm not knocking you. I'm just saying we're very cautious about things like that. Um, How about this one? Did you know that up to 40% of Americans have a fear or anxiety with flying? 40%. That's almost one out of two people have a, this, this fear, this anxiety of flying. Me, I love to fly. I think it's fun, okay? But I'm a weirdo, okay? Now, let's flip that. Did you know that you have a less than 1 in 11 million chance of being in a plane crash? But 40% of people are worried about flying. Um, Speaking of people who are trying to eat healthy and organic, and I didn't look up the percentage, but I mean, it's, I'm sure it's a lot of people, a large percentage. Here's another statistic. Did you know that 36.6% of Americans eat fast food on any given day, or basically regularly, 36.6% of Americans? Um, on the average, we spend two hours and 14 minutes per day on social media. And back in 2015, we spent about four hours and 42 minutes daily just watching TV. And now studies are finding that's not exactly the best way to live. Um, How about this one? 11.5% of Americans still smoke. Did we find out that smoking's bad? Yes, but 11.5% of people. So we have all of these worries and concerns and anxiety about all this stuff, but see, we're, we're doing some other things too. Here, here's another one. According to an auto insurance study, you ready for this? 73% of American drivers admit to texting while driving. Did you know, I, I saw a, a, a poster somewhere one time, texting while driving uh, is equal to having two hard drinks. Yes, oh my. And we're very, very cautious about a lot of 
perceive things, and some of those are real, and we're, we're just like overly cautious, but then we maybe do some other things that don't match up with that. Here's one more. Almost 10% of Americans do not wear their seatbelts. Wow. So we're kind, of, we're kind of pulled back and forth between this, this anxiety and worry and what's really dangerous, and, and it's just this kind of weird circle. But we often worry more about these perceived and, and, and smaller dangers while we ignore big dangers that are out there for us. And, and now maybe you say this. Now, when I say anxiety or worry, you're probably by now pushing back a little bit because you have your reasons to worry. And, and guess what? I do too. I'm human just like you. I have my reasons why like I worry about things and all that. But, but we say things like this. Well, I only worry about important things. Hmm. Or we say, I don't worry nearly as much as I used to. Or we say, you just don't understand my life. You just don't understand what's going on. You, if you knew, you, you would understand. Or here's a good one. I'm not worrying. I'm just concerned. Ooh. What are we doing there? We're justifying our worry. And Scripture is very, very, very clear about what we're supposed to do. So today I want to look at a passage that's been called the most significant verses dealing with mental health. And that's Philippians chapter 4. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 4. There's a Bible in front of you. If you don't want to turn there, if you don't have a Bible, uh, the words are going to be up on the screen here. So as you're turning to Philippians chapter 4, understand the Apostle Paul is writing this. And he's writing from a jail cell. And the book of, of Philippians is actually very encouraging. Now, wait a minute, Paul. If, if anyone ever had to worry about anything, it would be somebody rotting away in a jail not knowing their future. But see, Paul wasn't going to worry about that. So in Philippians chapter 4, he starts out in verse 1, and we're going to start reading in verse 6. But verse 1, he, he says some, starts out in some really encouraging things. He says, stand firm. Stand firm. In verse 2, he says, I plead with you. He's like, like I'm, I'm pleading with you guys, and he, and he makes his point. Verse 3, he's, he, it, the word in the NIV translation is ask, but, but it really means to make an earnest request. Paul is like, is, is pouring his heart out here like, guys, you've got to get this. I'm pleading with you. I'm begging with you. Stand firm. Verse four, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. You see kind of the, the attitude and the atmosphere and, and the heart from where Paul's coming from? This, what, what he's projecting, and remember, in, in Scripture, when they wrote this, they didn't write verse and, and chapter. They just wrote a letter, and it pretty much continually flowed. So he gives us those, those just, please, I'm begging you, rejoice, stand firm, those, those really awesome, uh, convicting things that he's telling us, and then he gets to verse 6. And you'll see this emphasis that we're talking about. Uh, Philippians 4, verse 6, he says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends or surpasses or is greater than all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, don't raise your hand, but was there any part in you when I was reading those verses, especially the, the very beginning of Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything. Was there anything in you that said, that sounds great, but it's just a little unrealistic? Maybe you're pushing back on me a little bit here. You're like, 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 it's really cool in theory that you say, I can just pray away my anxiety. Like, I'm all for prayer, 
but like I can just, hey God, I want to give my anxiety to you and he'll take it away. Like all of this worry that I've, I've dealt with since before I can remember that, that, that you'll just take it and that it just won't be there anymore, that God's just going to magically poof and it's gone. It sounds a little unrealistic, doesn't it? You know, maybe, okay, Trevor, maybe the small things in life God can take away. But you don't, you don't really understand what I'm dealing with in my life. You don't, you don't understand what's going on in my life. And these are big, real things like deadlines and illnesses and, 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 and relationship issues. You don't understand And it's funny because as I read this, there are no exceptions in Paul's writing. In fact, the word he uses, do not be anxious about what? Anything. And I I understand that, that response that you might have pushing back against this, I get it. I, I, I understand it. Now, in Scripture, sometimes, especially when you're you know, preaching on Paul's writings, you've got to really dig in deep. Like sometimes when Paul writes stuff, you just read it and you go, I need to read that again or like 12 more times. I have no idea what you just said, Paul. Sometimes, and this is how I like to preach because this is how I need to hear it. Sometimes Paul and, and, you know, through the inspiration of God puts things on the bottom shelf puts things to where they're easily attainable, and it's just like, here it is, and you're like, okay, but yeah, but that, there must be something more to it, and it's like, no, 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 here it is. Here's the answer, but here's the problem with those verses. Do not be anxious about anything. We normally can't get past that, that first part of verse six. Do not be anxious about anything. We, we, we struggle with that. We're like, Again, but you don't, you don't know my situation. But here's the deal. If you can get past the first part of this verse and trust in the rest of verse 6 and, the, and then verse 7, it's a game changer in your life. So I'm asking you, and, and I was telling people today that like this is going to be at least a, a two-part because as I started digging in, I'm like, there's just too much in here. So just fair warning, today I'm going to open up a massive can of worms, all right? And then I'm going to wish you farewell to go watch a football game and you have to come back next Sunday. That's just how it's going to be. But hopefully I can give you something today. So here's a question. Are you carrying way more than God has asked of you? Are you carrying in your life, is there this burden in your life about a thing or many things, and, and, and it is just weighing you down? You know what I'm talking about? Just that thing, and it's like you're just, you're holding stuff, and it's like, oh, uh, there's another one, and you're picking it up, and you drop one, and, and you, you pick it up, oh, there's another one, and you, got, and you're just, you feel like you're constantly carrying around all of these things. Guess what, church? God doesn't ask us to do that. What does he say? Cast all of your cares upon him because he cares about you. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Give me all of that junk because I want to take it for you. Are you carrying way more than God has asked of you? So here's what we're going to do over these next couple of weeks. We are going to look at the path to overcoming anxiety. And we've got four ways in these two verses here that we're going to see. We're going to look at two of them this week and two next week. The path to overcoming anxiety. Number one, we've got to recognize the problem. Recognize the problem. What's the problem? Anxious, anxiety, worry. Do not be anxious. The original Greek word for that anxious is merimnao. Everybody say merimnao. Wasn't that fun? Okay, 
So that word actually means three words that we translate in English. Worry, anxious, or care. Worry, anxious, care. Merimnao. It appears 19 times in 17 verses in the New Testament. 19 times. It's a very, very common word. Here's a couple of them. Matthew 6, 25. Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry or merimnao. Do not merimnao about your life, what you will eat or drink. Luke 10, 41. Jesus again is speaking, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. So it's a very common word. So I want us to look at it. And I think as we look at this word, it's going to help us understand a little bit more about what we need. So merimnao, it means worry, anxious, care. And it comes from two Greek words put together. And and I am not a Greek scholar, okay? But um, as I've researched, it's two words that come together. The first one is meridzo. Meridzo, it means to separate tear or divide into parts, and nous, the mind. So merizo and nous make merimnao. So if we were actually to define this word as it is with these two words put together, it means to separate, divide, or tear the mind into parts. Whoa. And isn't that exactly what anxiety and worry does to us. To tear, to divide, to separate just your mind, just to pull it into pieces. That's what anxiety does. So here's, here's a couple definitions I came up with. As we're talking about it, I usually like to do this as it pertains to these messages. What exactly are we talking about when we say anxiety or worry? Anxiety is when your mind is overcome or divided between legitimate and destructive thoughts and concerns. That's what anxiety is. When your mind is just, you're you're overcome with it, and it just pulls your mind apart from what is okay and reality and a legitimate concern all the way to this just, just illegitimate concern that can't be resolved in that moment. That's what anxiety is. Here's another one that I was thinking of, and we'll refer to this a lot, anxious thoughts. Anxious thoughts are when you spend more time thinking about unresolvable situations. There's the key there. When you spend more time thinking about unresolvable situations than you spend praying about and resolving what you can. See, there's a huge clue in there. That when we have this worry and anxiety, what is it that you're worrying about? What is it that you're anxious about? Things that you can't control. Things that you can't do anything about in the moment. And that's when our mind is just torn apart, torn into pieces. James 1.8 goes right along with this. It says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A a a man that is just torn one way in another way. What's reality? What's not? Like, like, I'm going to believe this truth and and this isn't truth, but just, just when your mind is torn apart, you are, you will be unstable in all your ways. Now, this is a problem here. Look at the short-term health problems just from anxiety and worry. Shaking, stress, heart palpitations, nausea, chest pain, dizziness, chills or hot flashes, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, headache, irritability, and I'm sure there are plenty others. Medically diagnosed conditions that go along with anxiety and worry. Now, I can tell you this is true. I, I told you earlier, I'm not a huge fan of spiders. So I had to, to look for something, and I went into this room, and it was dark. The light wasn't working. So I pulled out my phone, turned on my flashlight, right? And there was this old tarp, and I, I have my flashlight like this, and I move it, and a wolf spider flipping jumped Like right in front of me. Now, it, it, thankfully, it was a small one, and um, he's 
well, I can't say he's now with Jesus. He's in the other place, okay? <laughs> but like, immediately, my heart was racing. I, I have chills right now thinking about it, okay? But it completely freaked me out. Now, let's face it. Let's be honest. Is a little spider this big really going to hurt me more than maybe this tiny little mosquito bite? Probably not. But that's an unrealistic worry. And boom, like that, my heart was racing. I, 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 I just, ugh, goosebumps, and it freaked me out. I probably screamed like a little girl, but I'm not going to tell you guys that. <laughs> so those are short-term health problems. Here's the long-term health problems of chronic anxiety and worry. Insomnia, long-term stress, chronic pain, panic disorder, heart disease, and irrational or poor decisions. And again, we can look at that list and many of us will look at those and go, guilty. Yep, I deal with that. In addition to short-term and long-term health problems, there's also some spiritual problems that we find. Uh, uh, just like the long-term problems, spiritually, we make irrational or poor decisions. That we know what the right thing to do is. We know what God has called us to do. Do not be anxious about anything. Stop worrying. Do not fear. I don't know how many times Scripture says, do not fear. And we do it, we, we fear, and what do we do? We make poor choices, we make sinful choices that affect a lot in our lives. So we make irrational or poor decisions. It also impedes God's purpose for your life. When you make just ridiculous decisions based on your worry and your anxiety and your fear, oh man. God's purpose is God's going like, like I, 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 that's not the path I have for you. I have something so much better. And because you do not have peace in your life, you're not looking at me. You're looking at that thing. And God's like, no, 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 no. Keep your eyes focused on me. Stop looking at that fear, that worry, that anxiety. Stop looking at it. Look at me. Here's what anxiety says. When we, especially as believers, here's what I believe anxiety says. God, I just don't trust you enough to fully give this to you. That's what anxiety says. God, I know you told me to, but I, I just, I'm not sure if I can trust you enough to give this to you because I'm, I'm not sure. I know you've promised me like a million times in scripture, but I don't know because I, I, I'm not sure if you're going to fully take this from me, so I'm not going to give it to you. I'm going to hold it on my own. Anxiety says, God, I just don't trust you enough to fully give this to you. In 2019, there were 301 million people that were living with an anxiety disorder, including 58 million children and adolescents. That was in 2019. Now, that was worldwide. In 2020, it rose 27%. What happened in 2020? COVID. You see how one thing comes in and boom, our anxiety goes through the roof. Approximately 40 million Americans have an anxiety disorder. Uh, in psychology today, there was a 2019 Gallup poll and it said the United States leads the world with the highest rates of anxiety. Now, I have another statistic, but what do you think, as I did some more research and reading, what do you think is usually the number one factor of worry or anxiety? Money, wealth, stuff. Will I have enough? Am I going to make it? You ready for this? In that same article, it said wealthy countries had the highest rates of anxiety. Wait a minute. 
if we're mostly anxious about money, why is it that wealthy countries have the most anxiety? Those two things, you know, one of these things is not like the other, square peg, round hole, it doesn't make sense, does it? But that tells us that this anxiety and worry is a perceived issue, not a real issue. Now, as a believer looking at an unbelieving world, I kind of get it. I kind of understand when when I look out at an unbelieving world, I understand why there is so much anxiety with them. I mean, according to unbelievers, we're basically just a bunch of meat robots trying to figure out this whole life thing, right? Trying to figure out how to navigate a life with problems and real issues and situations and and illnesses and, and all of these things, and there's no real answer. So I get it. I get why an unbelieving world would be anxious. Here's another uh, article that I read. This is in lifehacker.com. This was written by Alan Henry. I got to give him credit for this, although I'm not sure that that's what we're going to call this. He says this, anxiety is a perfectly normal and natural part of being a human. What? Is that what we read in Philippians chapter 4? That's completely opposite. It goes on to say, anxiety itself is a natural human response that serves a purpose. Our goal, like, I got to breathe before I read this. Our goal shouldn't be to dismiss it entirely, just to make it a healthy, manageable part of our lives. Wow. You want to talk about hopelessness? That's it. That's what the unbelieving world sees. Like, okay, listen, we're never really going to get rid of anxiety, so we just got to figure out how to manage it and maybe use it for our benefit. That's the best that the world can do. Guys, church, we have so much better than that. Now, as a believer, I look at believers, and, and myself included, God's word God's promises prevent me from understanding and accepting anxiety and worry. They, 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 they keep me from just going, it's okay, it's just something that I have to live with. It's just something that I have to manage because guess what? It's not. It isn't. So the path to overcoming anxiety, number one, we've got to realize the problem. That's anxiety. Number two, We have to experience the prescription. Experience the prescription. Philippians 4, 6. It's right there. Do not be anxious about anything. Did you catch it? Did you catch what the prescription is? It's right there in that verse. Do not be anxious about anything. You see the prescription there, what we're supposed to do? I'll give you a hint. It's a lot more simple than you think. It's not a 12-step process. I don't need four points and a poem to get this across. It's right there. Paul, through the inspiration and instruction of the Holy Spirit, the prescription, he's just commanding us to not worry. That's it. Don't do it. Okay, cool. I mean, I could have saved us all a lot of time I got a lot of cooking to do today for some party, okay? I could have just said, hey, anxiety is bad. Don't do it. See you next week. (laughs) Is it really that simple? I'll say it this way. Do I really have the guts to stand up here in front of you and tell you that? Like the key to overcoming anxiety is to not do it. I mean, here's the thing, church. These aren't my words. This is God's word. It's right here. How do we not worry? We not worry. Kind of circular argument there, isn't it? In the Greek, 
if you read this word for word as it's written out, it says something like this. Stop worrying about even one thing. That's how it's written out. Stop worrying about even one thing. It's really interesting. Jesus says pretty much the exact same thing. So turn to Matthew chapter 6 with me. Matthew chapter 6, this is the Sermon on the Mount. Most of us know this passage. I love this passage. It's basically right in the middle, and Jesus just goes off about worry and anxiety and and, and our cares that we have as it relates to that. So Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25, he says, therefore, which remember, we love that word, therefore, I tell you, do not, what's that word? Worry, merimnao, same word. Do not worry about your life. Wait a minute, what? If I don't worry about my life, who's going to worry about it for me? God's going, me? Guys, therefore I tell you, Jesus says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And I love this line. Are you not much more valuable than they? So good. Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? That's a little bit convicting, isn't it? Now, I have to say, I got to pause here real quick because it's really easy to read this passage and possibly come away with the idea that Jesus is advocating for laziness, that Jesus is saying, hey, listen, stop worrying about things like it's all going to be fine. Just, just, just go sit at home and watch TV and like everything will happen to you. That's not what Jesus is saying. Well, it Kind of sounds like that. Okay, yes. So when we come to something in Scripture that looks to be, uh, that doesn't look right, what do we do? We say it all the time. We compare Scripture to Scripture. Here's a couple of verses right here. 1 Timothy 5.8. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Woo. Here's another one, Proverbs 10, 4. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. Proverbs 12, 4, or 12, 24. Diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends in forced labor. So obviously, Jesus is not advocating that we just sit around and let things happen to us. That's not how it works here. But what he is saying is to not be anxiously over-concerned about things that are going to divide your mind. And he is saying, just trust me, trust me, I will take care of you. Now, Jesus, this master storyteller, he gives us an example that we can see, birds. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm... convicted after studying by this. I'm going to spend some time this week. I have a lot of birds that come into my yard. I've I've got this really cool orchid tree. We have hummingbirds come in sometimes. And I'm just going to take some time, and I want to encourage you to do this this week, just to sit and watch birds. I know that might sound super boring to you, but I want you to do it. And as you do it, I, I want you to watch their nature. Have you ever seen a bird worry? You haven't, have you? Now, you've seen a bird doing work. You've seen a bird gathering. You've seen, you know, like, like birds. I heard this really cool story about eagles. And when eagles, there's only one bird that attacks eagles. I don't know if this is true. I saw it on social media, so it's probably not. But it said the only bird that attacks eagles, I just thought it was relevant for here, is a crow. And you're like, wait a minute. How would a crow attack an eagle. Like an eagle's way bigger. If you've ever seen bald eagles, we see them up on the stretch all the time. Like they're massive, but this crow, and this crow will actually land on top of him as he's flying and start pecking at him and pecking at his head. Does the eagle freak out? No. 
what the eagle does is he starts soaring up and up and up and up and up to an altitude where the crow can't take it anymore. And so the whole point of that story was, hey, stop worrying about those little things in your life that can't really do any damage. Rise above it. That was good, wasn't it? I just thought of that. You don't have to clap for that. Okay. All right. But I want you guys to observe some birds this week and think about this as we're reading this. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And then watch this phrase, and yet, what's that next word? Your heavenly Father. Wait a minute. We're not talking about us. We're talking about birds, aren't we? Do you realize what this verse is saying? We're talking about birds, and Jesus is saying, hey, you see how they don't really worry about things? Yes, they take care of bird stuff. They, birds are going to do bird things, okay? But Jesus is saying, but your heavenly Father feeds them. It's pretty interesting that Jesus uses this phraseology. He's like, listen, I'm going to take care of them, and not, I'm not even their heavenly father. Like, they don't even have a f- heavenly father. They're just birds, but you do. So if God takes care of birds, even though he's not their heavenly father, watch this. Jesus doesn't even stop there. He goes on. He gives us even another example and takes it further. Verse 28. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not, how much more, a little bit more, significantly more? much more clothe you. And then he just kicks you while you're down. You of little faith. You think his audience was having issues with anxiety and worrying about things? Yeah. And he straight up calls them out right there. And Jesus, he finally, he stops kind of as if he really is, but he's somewhat beating around the bush, right? And he hits them over the head with this massive theological truth bomb. He's saying, listen, when birds do bird things and flowers and grass, they do flowers and grass things, God's going to take care of them. And then he says, his whole point with that is, When people do people things, and people things are what God has commanded us to do, so basically being obedient to God, following God's word, doing what it says, knowing what it says, and then doing what it says, trusting in him, not being anxious or worrying about things. When you do those things, guess what happens? I'm going to take care of you. If if the birds are, I'm not even their heavenly father, like if I'm going to take care of them because birds are doing their thing, you do your thing that I've asked you to do or commanded you to do, and I will take care of you. That's what Jesus is saying in this. Stop focusing on those other things. I'm really glad everyone wore clothes today, okay? Clothes are important. Don't not wear clothes but don't worry about them. And Jesus says, your heavenly Father will take care of you when you lose sight of all those really kind of other things, you keep focused on me. Is there heavy stuff in life? Are there problems in life? Yes, absolutely. And Jesus is like, keep your eyes focused on me. I will walk alongside of you through those things. Jesus is saying, trust me, do not worry. Verse 31, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Now, here is a huge 
verse that often gets taken out of context and maybe not necessarily taken out of context, but really when it's isolated, you don't get a fraction of the meaning behind it. Now that we have read through, Jesus is saying, hey, don't worry about stuff. Like birds, I got them. Grass, I got them. Flowers, I got them. You, I've got you. Okay? Just, just keep your eyes focused on me. Now, with the backdrop of all that said, we come to Matthew 6, and it says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things. Now we understand a little bit more about what this verse means. All these things that we just talked about will be given to you as well. And then he just puts an exclamation point, verse 34, therefore, I said all that to say this, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble on its own. He's saying, listen, why? There's going to be plenty to worry about tomorrow. Don't, don't worry about tomorrow. Focus on right now. Focus on me. Focus on what you can do in the situation, not about what you can't do. By the way, just to throw this out there, there's not a lot you can do at 3 a.m. Worrying is just like a circle. just keeps going and going and going. It never stops. Jesus says, each day it's got enough trouble on its own. Keep your eyes focused on me. So the path to overcoming anxiety. Number one, we've got to recognize the problem. The problem, simply anxiety. And really, we need to recognize it's neither normal nor acceptable. According to God's word. Now, this isn't me. This isn't Trevor saying, hey, you guys shouldn't worry because, well, I think you shouldn't. It's not my words. It's God's word. It is not normal, nor is it acceptable to worry about things we cannot control. So the path to overcoming anxiety, number one, recognize the problem. Number two, experience the prescription. Don't do it. It's a command. I know that's a bold statement, and I know we're looking at that, and, and guys, we covered one phrase of one verse today. We've got a whole lot more to cover next week. So I get it. I get that I am, like I said earlier, just opening up this can of worms and saying, hey, anxiety's a problem, and the way to not do it is to not do it. So obviously, you got to come back for next week, Right? But we can see that there's something here. We can see that Jesus is going, guys, this is not your problem. Those things in your life that are so consuming, give them to me. Let them be my problem. You just do you stuff. You just do what I've commanded you to do in that book. And not, by the way, not because God likes rules, that's not it. It's because God wrote life in the way that it is going to propel you forward. So God's saying, just follow me and it will all be okay. So here's our prayer for this week. God, pretty simple. Help me to follow your clear command to not be anxious. That's it. That's the prayer that we all need to be praying this week. God, you've commanded it. Like, just help me to follow that command. I know it's overly simplistic. I know it's, it's, it, it really makes no sense. I know you've got decades and decades and decades of worry behind you, backing you up. And God says, I'm just telling you, give it to me. Throw it my way. I'll take it. Let's pray. God, you are so good. And God, thank you for not only commanding us to not worry, not only commanding us to give you those worries and concerns and that anxiety, 
but promising that you will take it from us. Two completely separate things, God. Thank you, God, that your word says, as we said earlier, that we can throw all of our worries and our cares, our anxiety on you. We can, we can give them to you. We can let them be your burden. Why? Because you care for us. Because you love us. Because you want to see us excel in life. Because you want to see us follow you. Not because you're, you're this, this mean ruler, but because you are a loving father. So God, help us to follow you. Help us to stop taking on too much stuff. God, help us to stop feeling the burden of so many things and to trust you. Help us to trust you enough, God, to give it to you. And God, I know this morning that there are some people here who, who don't know you personally, who might not be able to call you their Savior, who, who might not be able to say, yes, I have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you know some things about him. Maybe, you know, you've been to church a handful of times. And you, but, God, maybe there are people here that don't have a relationship with you. Right now in this moment, if that's you, that you're saying, I, I, I can't say that I know Jesus as my Savior. Right now, if I stood before God, I, I, I'm not sure what I would say when he asked, why should I let you in? So if that's you this morning, if right now in this moment you would love to start a relationship with Jesus, that you want to call him your Savior and your friend, right now in this moment, would you just say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, come into my life. Save me. Change me. I give you all of me. I trust that you, Jesus, hung on a cross to take away my sin and rose again three days later for me to prove victory over death over hell and over the grave. Heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If that was you this morning, you said that for the first time, I'd love to know about it. I'm not gonna call you out or anything, but I would just love for you to slip your hand up so I can be praying for you. Would you just slip your hand up and say, I got it right today. I gave my life to Jesus today. I started a relationship with him. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Today is the day that I got it right with Jesus. Father, we thank you that you are such a good God. We thank you that we can trust you, that you are not some insignificant force in the universe, that you are a heavenly Father who desires daily relationship with us. God, help us to pursue you like you pursue us. Thank you that you are a good God. God, thank you for those this morning who have decided to give their lives to you. God, would you wrap them in your arms, help them to feel your love. And God, as we enter into this time of offering, God, would you just help us to be generous Help us to be wise, God, as we further your kingdom through the generosity of this church. Thank you for who you are, Lord. We love you and we praise you, and it is in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen.